Imagine a world where you knew that you mattered and you belonged, that people cared about you because we were so darn good at listening to one another, no matter how different we are. That is what Sidewalk Talk is doing by putting listeners on sidewalks all over the world so that we can practice the art of connecting. Join me, founder and director Tracy Rubel, as I interview experts on the fine art of human connection and interview some of our volunteers who've been listening on the sidewalk and even some of the folks that we've listened to. And if you want to volunteer, consider joining us at sidewalk-talk.org. Dr. Charlie Eastman is a UK-based doctor, and he brings such a breadth of experience to help us all widen our embrace to so many different kinds of people. He was one of the only black doctors in his graduating class, and he shares with us what that experience was like and how it shaped him, but also his many years working in international medicine, also working with refugees in Rwanda. He's traveled all over and worked and operated across Africa, Egypt, Israel, Tunisia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. And more recently, his work is focused on corporate mental health as he looks and sees high-stress individuals coming in late stage with real significant health problems, wanting to help access them sooner so that stress doesn't impact their overall physical health. What a breadth of experience and passion he has. And I love that he really gets deeply what Sidewalk Talk is all about. So I can't wait for you to hear this conversation. And if you want to learn more about Dr. Eastman's work, you can check out Total Health UK, his organization, Dr. Charlie Eastman. Dr. Eastman, hi. Hi, Chris. Yeah, how are you? Good. And how lucky am I? Isn't it like 6 p.m. your time? (laughs) <laughs> yep. I just came out of the underground, so uh, I was hoping I could get uh, home where my Wi-Fi works. So don't worry, we can talk as I walk on my way to home. Do you want me to call you? And fi- do you want to try back in in 15 minutes so that it doesn't feel so stressful? No, to no, you? no. This is good. This is good. This All right. Because you know you are a doctor, and you sort of advocate for people leading healthy lives. So uh, s- stressing out in the <laughs> underground, I can't imagine is good for your blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So it's okay. I'll, I'll tell you why. I, I so first of all, Dr. Charlie is. You've been a doctor for a long time. You've done some important stuff in the world. I think I was pretty wowed by some of the stuff you did with refugees in Rwanda in 1996. And more recently, you. doing some stuff with, you've sort of moved into or are compelled by mental health in the workplace and are working on a book called, which made me crack up because I'm still with you on this, called Make Work Human Again. And so that's right. Yep. I just wanted to get a little human with you. And, and I, I guess I'm on this planet to, to connect to more people's stories that see the world differently than I do and practice listening and, yeah. and hearing, you know? <laughs> Well, I, I have to say, firstly, I, I love what you do and what you've created because I just think it's the most wonderful idea. But um, on the mental health side, that really comes from working with a lot of distressed people because if you work as a, an occupational health doctor, if I'd done this job 100 years ago, you would have sent me people from factories who'd had their legs chopped off or something had caved their head in physically. But now uh, people are having their heads caved in mentally, either by work or stresses outside of work. So a large volume of the people you're referred are referred with mental health issues. But interestingly, some of those issues are either caused or aggravated by the workplace. And this is an issue that we really have to address. You know, what's the point of human evolution uh, if (laughs) we've just created uh, a whole lot of uh, stress pens for people and uh, we just put them around in these little stress pens. Yeah. You know, maybe evolution hasn't done so, so ha, we haven't done so, so well in our evolutionary process. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm yeah, on a hunt I think to talk a, to people a, all over the world because I keep thinking that I'm going to find some pocket in the world where some community. Sorry, or, I, I lost your volume there. 
Oh, I, I keep hoping that, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. I keep hoping that there's going to be some pocket in the world where they've done better evolutionarily to not be so stressed and have all these mental health things. Like what is going on with us? Is it a first world problem or, or what? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think the Western world has got a lot of things wrong in the march towards uh, technological supremacy. And if you look at a lot of the Eastern world and the philosophies, I really think they're 3,000 years ahead in terms of their thinking about the, uh, we won't use balance, uh, but the issue around uh, what is life, what is enjoyment, and also how to keep uh, a peaceful mind. So we've created a situation for a lot of people where they're sold a false god in the sense of you know, money, opportunity, progression. And they all come out of either universities or whatever thinking, you know, these are the goals I need to aim for. And in so doing, some of them do achieve these amazing bits of wealth or power. But then it's only later on that people realize, well, actually, that doesn't bring me fulfillment. Yeah. Um, and um, I remember there's a very famous man in England called uh, Jeremy Paxman. And he went to one of the top universities. And when uh, he was in his uh, early 20s or te late teens, he and a group sat around discussing what future careers they were going to get, how they were going to take on the world. And uh, one guy in the group said his only ambition was to be happy. And they all laughed at him as if he was the most uh, pathetic creature they'd ever come across. And uh, Jeremy Paxman then suffered, you know, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, he became very successful, but he realized years later that that guy had got it right all those years ago. Hmm. Well, I want to ask you something personal because you are an MD. You also grew up, I did a little research on you before we talked. You grew up in a boarding school. Your dad was a doctor. Yeah. I mean, this is a pretty driven, you're, you're, com you're coming from a pretty driven background yourself. So how do you make sense of it in your own personal life? Yeah, sure. So let's, um, my dad's an interesting one because he had um, uh, no active involvement in my life. And in fact, I would always say he was a negative because the rejection I had from him not being in my life was not helpful to my mental health. And probably at the age of 13, I did suffer a, a period of uh, depression. Um, and my mother being a nurse uh, was very against medication and uh, didn't allow me to take it. So maybe that was a good thing. But anyway, I had about a year where I was definitely uh, struggling as to who I was and what life was about. And I think what came out of that was an interest in literature and people from Oscar Wilde to Lord Byron and the realization that sometimes the great artists who've also suffered um, can give you a reference point for your own suffering. So that was part one. Part two was then um, progressing out of that, uh, dealing with day-to-day -day life as a, uh, a young student in boarding school and wanting to get into the profession of medicine. And from then on, it's been uh, a path where, like everybody, you have your ups and downs, but it's that gradual learning about what's important and what gives you balance. And so, you know, I've had my... Uh, ups and downs in terms of getting divorced, uh, losing a business and things like that. But apart from short periods, I've never let any of those things absolutely destroy the inner me because I've realized that you retain um, uh, a, a sense of self. That's a very important point. And also you, you adapt to whatever new circumstances you are. So if you don't have a lot of money, then you find ways to uh, make the most with the little that you have, is you see what I mean. So I think that um, life always throws adversity at you, and the challenge is how to um, adapt to that. Um, sometimes we can train people, you know, whether we do specific aspects of resilience training. Uh, sometimes it's inherent philosophy, i.e. what's your belief system in terms of, you know, how the world's going to play out and mm -hmm. what the next steps are. Uh, and in other cases, it's it's um, the support of friends, family. Uh, some people obviously will need medication. Some will need counselling. Um, so yeah, no, I, I very much empathise with my clients who've been through 
uh, difficult periods. And I think that helps me uh, be a better doctor. Yeah. Well, I, I'm curious to hear from you as a, as a medical doctor. There's a lot going on in the world today besides our jobs that are stressing us out. Yeah. You know, I, I'm living in Germany, but I'm from the United States, pretty politically yeah. active. People are pretty stressed <laughs> out in my town about politics. Lots of I people I know are stressed out about the environment, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of inequality yeah. where I'm from with people yeah. not having equal yeah. opportunity. They don't have health care. Yeah. Are you yeah. seeing any sort? I mean, I know you're in a different part of the world, but do these factors yeah. begin to weigh on somebody's physical health? Are you seeing that? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think that, um, okay, so there's two ways of looking at a terrible life situation. You can either say, I'm the problem, or you can say the system's the problem, yeah? yeah? And I think that in some cases, clearly the system is the problem. So here, we don't always have the right housing, we don't always have the right sense of community. And so these social aspects uh, are really important to people's welfare. So all the data confirms that, you know, medical intervention only represents about 10% of the benefits to your health. The rest is to do with your environment, your housing, and everything else. If you don't get that right, then people are going to suffer. So yes, we're definitely seeing that as well. Um, I think that there needs to be literally a counter-movement to the uh, over-aggressive, over-commercial, uh, market rules mentality that has been dominant for a long time. And I'm very pleased to have met a Californian, actually, uh, a gentleman called George Kinder, who started a group called uh, A Golden Civilization, and he's written a book about that. And what George says is, look, why don't we get cells together of people to discuss what we think would make the world a better place, mm. and some of us, within those discussions, will be in positions where we can actually implement some of that change. Mm. So that's, that's what I see as one of the positive movements. So are you part of this movement? Yeah, so I'm, I'm very much uh, in touch with George. I, I went to his talk, I got his book, I've distributed it to friends, I've made the connection. Uh, we've got to have, in fact, George and I are due to have this sort of conversation. Uh, it's just uh, my diary hasn't yet allowed us to do that. Um, and then the other thing that um, follows on from that, I was recently talking to someone uh, about an idea around creating um, uh, islands of kindness. Uh, and I do believe this is a viable idea, and I believe it's a worthwhile idea. So creating communities or environments where the basic rule is to be kind and not to be discriminatory. And for some people, even spending uh, an hour or a day or half a day in that environment will itself be therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And I was very pleased to see recently that someone started up a museum of kindness mm -hmm. uh, where they documented uh, amazing examples of uh, kindness between human beings. Mm -hmm. What do you imagine if we had these islands of kindness on the planet and they took off and it became a, yeah. staple, a staple part of our everyday lives, you would see in your medical practice? What do you think the trickle out effect of that would be in your caseload? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, okay, so if you look at discrimination, for example, um, discrimination has a huge impact on people's physical and mental health. It makes you less confident. Uh, it, in some cases, it affects your basic competency to do things. There was a recent study showing that if you were nasty to uh, a young surgeon who was assisting you, their, their clinical competence drops by about 20 or 30 percent. So that's wow. just one example. If you, if you look at the uh, uh, black people in the United States, for example, mm -hmm. uh, there are some theories that actually link the uh, high blood pressure to the constant level of discriminatory stress. Um, that's right. And that's not impossible. Um, so I think the, these issues um, clearly have an impact. They, they need some sort of uh, uh, public health type measure, but they can be done. And there are examples, I believe, where these things have been achieved. What are, what are some of your favorite standout programs where you feel like discrimination has been tackled in a way that's helped somebody's overall health? Yeah. And I know certainly Absolutely. Dr. Nadine well, Burke um, is getting lots of press right now in, as the Surgeon General in California for amplifying childhood yeah. trauma. What are some, some other programs that, as a medical yeah. doctor, yeah, you have so, on your mind? 
Yeah. Yeah, so um, the Anne Frank Foundation, mm. um, they send people into schools to talk about uh, discrimination in a general sense, not just about Jews and the Holocaust. And so I think they've done some really excellent work. Um, I, personally, I think that uh, the history of prejudice should be part of every school curriculum in the sense that I believe only by educating our children from a very young age what the negative impacts of prejudice have been throughout history will we be able to deal with some of the uh, other side of it such as the rise of the far right um, mm -hmm. because the far right thrives in a vacuum of ignorance and if we didn't have that ignorance to start with uh, I don't believe they'd be as, as, as successful as they are now in some communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed that I'm, ha I, I'm, I'm not amazed. I, I love that I'm having a conversation with a medical doctor from Ghana, and we're talking about <laughs> what could elevate somebody's physical health, and, and you immediately make a link to discrimination and how if we want to have, and I, discrimination in all the ways that di discrimination comes about, right? Whether you've got housing, Absolutely. whether yeah. you've got health care, whether someone's a jerk to you when you're a medical resident, um, whether you've got yeah. access to all the same opportunities, yada, 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 they all lead to the kinds of inflammation, stress, and shortened lifespans that you've described. And I, I think it's powerful that that's yeah. where your focus is. So how do you imagine um, cross this, this you, you brought, I want to link it to something else that you said, because you talked about yeah. the ways in which the economy drives some of our not so nice behavior. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that there's this quality of a market driven society rather than a people driven society, which, which makes me think of your book. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think, you know, the interesting thing is, right. So we've polarized the discussion around capitalism and communism. And mm -hmm. it's very much the implication is you're either one or the other. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the U.S., um, there was a huge anti red movement and you know, you, you just couldn't even mention the very idea. Um, and I think what that got translated at was mm -hmm. to say, oh, anything that's a social intervention is communist, which is stupid because mm -hmm. social interventions are not communist. They're just ways of dealing with the fact that we're social human beings. And I think the other problem that happened was that there was a lot of uh, individualistic mentality. You know, I'm out there, I'm going to succeed and uh, let's forget everyone else who doesn't. And the mentality around the sort of Amran type of fountainhead uh, mentality was very much um, dominant for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so the counter to that is to say, well, hang on, how did we evolve? We're basically human uh, social beings, and part of our evol evolution included cooperation. And if we uh, accept the fact that cooperation is a key part of what we do, we would relook really at the economic models that are just based on individual uh, self-interest and in a sense based on individual greed. And I was very interested to read uh, recently uh, one of the wealthiest people in the US, I, I think, I can't even remember how much he's worth, but let's say it's more than 250 million. And he was complaining <laughs> that uh, people wanted a chunk of his 250 million. Now, what amused me about that is, I mean, there comes a level of wealth what else are you going to do with that money mm -hmm. in your lifetime? You know, I, how many more yachts, how many more houses, how many more uh, shirts uh, can you buy? You know, there comes mm -hmm. a point where uh, you're kidding yourself uh, around your own greed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's actually a fellow in, in your neighborhood. I think, gosh, I can't remember his name. Robert Gilbert. I think it's the Compassion Institute right. where he talks about the more wealth and power we accumulate, the less compassionate we become which I find fascinating That's right. research. That's right. Yeah, and there was the, the guy who wrote the letter to his fellow uh, uh, wealthy people where he, again, makes this point. Um, and uh, he says, look, you know, I've made a shed load of money, but I realize that we can't carry on this way mm -hmm. and we need to think about other people. You know, mm -hmm. otherwise you end up with what I call a drawbridge society mm -hmm. where uh, those of you who are the super wealthy less one percent. You live in your moated castle, uh, mm -hmm. scared out of your wits because the uh, what we'll call the hoi polloi or the sons to lot are outside and about to raid you. Now that doesn't help you. It creates anxiety in you. 
uh, mm -hmm. creates a protected mentality in you and it doesn't make That's you right. happy. So in the end, we've got to work as cooperative with it. I love that you, I love this model because I don't, it's new to me, this idea of this drawbridge society where we, we kind of, we become more almost protective and, you know, judgy and distancing and, you know, I'm a psychotherapist by trade. That's how I make my living. And yeah. um, I'm very interested yeah. in how to, it's that thing that you just said that I think is a, is a starting point. I know for me, the starting point and the way for me to be a social activist is to sit my butt on a sidewalk and listen to as many people as I can, which I've been doing for five years. Which is wonderful. It's a wonderful gift. It's I wasn't fishing gift. for a compliment, yeah. I swear. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, but you deserve one. You deserve one. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll take it in. But what I wanted to find out is for folks, for all of us, and for maybe folks that, that aren't listening on sidewalks, what do you think, it, tied to the links that you're seeing in terms of people's health, yeah. is it these islands of kind? What could somebody do in their everyday life to begin to alter yeah. this course of this drawbridge society, this discriminatory society, or this greed-based society that's making us sick? Yeah, well, I think... Um... Part of it is that, you know, there are people who suggest, you know, try and think generously a bit more each day. That's one point. And the other thing is uh, trying to work on your empathy. Some people don't have much to start with. Others have it, but it's not fully developed. And one thing you can do is, like, in, in London, for example, a lot of homeless people, and I can't give money to every homeless person I see, but I can still acknowledge their humanity. So I can choose not to look away. I can choose to, if they say good morning to me, at least say good morning to them, even though I may not uh, dish out uh, some of my uh, hard-earned money to them. Um, and then within that, I may decide, well, okay, there's a little bit I can afford. Um, I'll do my own research as to what I think is the best bang for buck. If I don't feel that handing £10 notes to people on the street is particularly constructive because I'm worried they might end up using it for alcohol or drugs, I'll find a, a, a charity that I feel could do that um, in a constructive fashion. So I think sometimes um, people forget that we gain hugely from giving. Throughout my life, I've found that every time I've uh, taken someone else's uh, uh, situation into account and helped them uh, unselfishly, I have gained in some way mm. uh, or, or shape. And a lot of people forget that you can gain from giving. Yeah. So I'm hearing two things, to, de to, to, humanize, to rehumanize everybody you come across and to, to not forget that even in the act of humanizing them, saying hello, that that generosity is a two-way street. It benefits you and it benefits the person that you're, you're actually acknowledging. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I like that. If, you know, my intention is to learn from you about how to be a better connector out in the world. And you and I have different, I'm, I'm like this 50 year old white woman from Northern California living in Germany. And you're this, I don't know how, how old you are now, but you're, you're a Ghanaian man living in the UK. <laughs> who's, who's, who was, were you the, one of the only black students in your medical class? I, I think I read something that you were kind of an only somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, so, so when I was at boarding school, at one point, I was the only black student among 300. <laughs> and uh, that was across the age ranges. And then when I was at med school, um, there were just two of us who were uh, black from Africa originally, although my friend Frank always said he was from uh, a part of London called Hearn Hill, and he wouldn't accept his uh, Nigerian origin. <laughs> and uh, we had uh, some others. So um, we were very aware of... Um, uh, those uh, differences. And in fact, um, the, the, the history of discrimination at medical school was quite interesting because uh, one of the first examples was uh, an Italian uh, guy uh, who had a name, uh, Neynani was his surname. And before he qualified, he changed his name to Morley. And we all said, well, why have you done that? And he said, well, with a name like Neynani, I'll get less jobs. So we realized that a white male with a non-English sounding name uh, feared discrimination. So that was stage one. Then we had a, a Sikh uh, with us who uh, wore a Sikh turban. And uh, his story was interesting because he was applying for jobs and not getting them, despite the fact that he was a very, very good 
a student and has by that stage a very good doctor. So he actually um, uh, uh, pretended to be uh, an employer so that he could see the uh, references that were being sent on his behalf. And the reference went something along the lines of uh, Dr. X is an excellent doctor, but given his racial origin, his career is bound to be rather limited. Mm -hmm. So uh, the reference itself was a discriminatory reference. So that was uh, another learning point. Then another learning point was uh, we, we had an excellent doctor who was, you know, he, this guy was like Errol Flynn as far as we could say. He was handsome, charming, everything. And he started, he was right, he went out with a nurse. We thought, you know, this is going to be the marriage of the century. And then one day in the common room, he said the marriage was over. And we all looked at him and said, well, what was wrong? Because, you know, we think you're the perfect specimen. And he said, well, her parents didn't like me because I was Polish. Wow. And so these were little nuggets uh, of information around discrimination that we were picking up uh, while we were medical students. How do you thrive through that, though, and not develop a chip on your shoulder that impedes you becoming a doctor? <laughs> yeah, I think, okay, I think the, you make certain moves. So if the odds are stacked against you, then, then there's certain times where I don't believe it's worth sticking in that system. And sure. uh, I left relatively early the uh, NHS system because I could see some discrimination uh, uh, ahead. Now, mm -hmm. others of my friends uh, did get through the system by working maybe a, a lot harder than they would have had to if they had not been uh, black or Asian in origin, but that wasn't mm -hmm. the pathway that suited me. Um, the other thing I think over the years, I've kind of accepted that there is um, an inherent uh, prejudice among a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Some of it is based on ignorance and some of it is based on bad will. The ignorant ones, you can hope that at some point you might uh, have some influence in educating. The ones who've got bad will, you may never change, and you have to sort of, unfortunately, accept that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm such a shit disturber that I don't like to accept the bad will people, but I'm learning to. <laughs> I probably have yeah. you know, got a few gray hairs on my head because of that, but I, I, I hear what you're saying. Right. I, hear the, yeah. I hear the wisdom in that. Yeah. I think I've got a certain yeah. privilege because I'm a blonde haired, blue eyed gal, so I can go up and give someone a hard time and get away with it on some level, right? <laughs> I know, I know. It, it, but it is fascinating to uh, see aspects of it in action. And, and uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes I think your best defense for your own mental health, depending on who you are and where you are in the victim chain, is to say, you know, I'm off. I'm not uh, staying in this negative environment. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's a the best offense the best the best offense is having a good defense and saying I'm out and tapping out. Yeah, yeah I yeah. hear that. I hear yeah. that. So if we were to create more health, then mm -hmm. how, how do we all reduce? It? And and I'm linking it back to the discriminatory pieces. Whether you're Polish mm. and, and the yeah. in laws don't like you, or you're black and you're the only in your medical <laughs> class, or you're a woman and yeah. you know, you've got a bunch of male. Yeah. Exactly. I mean. And we know that this has a direct impact on our health. Absolutely. What is yeah. it? Is no, it just is it just rehumanizing each other, or is there some other way? No, I think I think I think that's right. I think there are various strands. So if you look at uh, uh, on the sexism side, there's the lady who started a thing called Everyday Sexism, and mm -hmm. she's written uh, some books on that. And uh, there's a Nigerian author who's got a fantastic TED talk on why we should all be feminist, and uh, they've even used that as a little book. Right? Um, so there are nuggets of wisdom out there. The question is, how do you uh, maybe make those more prominent, uh, mm -hmm. more available? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you uh, maybe uh, counter some of the more negative role models out there? So when I say role models, I mean politicians or uh, media stars who really show uh, a negative uh, in terms of their approaches to uh, people, how do you counter them? And, and that, that's something I don't think we've really resolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we're trying to do it one conversation at a time by setting our butts on a sidewalk and trying, it's, I mean, the sidewalk is the ultimate space of equality. You can't pay someone to walk over the sidewalk for you. I mean, I guess you, I guess you could. <laughs> no, I, I guess I could lift yeah, you up from right. your cab and carry you into your building, but usually people have to walk across the sidewalk, right? 
And um, yeah. the hope is, is that by having people sit out on sidewalks and listen non-judgmentally to story after story after story, it begins to change yeah. that brain that's ignorant. Mine I included. think it's a wonderful thing. And uh, yeah, no, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of it in the UK. Well, if I come up, I will, I will knock on your door and tell you to come sit on the sidewalk with us. <laughs> Come try it. It's really, it's I'll really be, fun. I'll, I'll be delighted to do so. And uh, I think I'll, I'll bring my son into this equation as well. He's, he's 19. He's an actor. Oh, he would love it. Uh, yeah, he would love it. He would love it. He'd, He'd be right really up his good. alley. Yeah. So yeah. 7,000 people that volunteer for Sidewalk Talk in across 15 countries are going to be sent this conversation that you and I have had. And mm. I've gotten to do some reflective listening and just kind of hear what you've had to say and what your life experience is. If there's any wish or piece of advice that you might speak directly to those 7,000 volunteers, what wish or piece of advice would you give to us so that we could be better connectors out there on the sidewalk? Yeah, well, that's a great one. And I think that um, I'm going to link it to uh, a musician called Joe South who wrote, he's from Atlanta, I think he was 26 at the time. And he's the guy who wrote the famous song covered by Elvis and everyone else, uh, Walk a Mile in My Shoes. Mm. And, of course, that phrase comes from, as I understand it, the Native American Indian, mm. where he said, uh, don't judge a man until you've walked at least two miles in his moccasins, right? Mm. So, so I think that what you said, that non-judgmental approach to people and just finding out, well, how have you ended up where you are? And if I take my judgment out of it and I listen to you and I give you the chance to um, express uh, why you're where you are, maybe I can uh, understand more. Maybe I can uh, give some useful tips, directions, or tools to help you get to a different one. Mm. Mm. Non-judgmental. That's a real key highlight takeaway. Hey, I know that you're talking with us at the end of your day. So I just want to express a deep gratitude that you gave us a a sliver of your time and your very busy life. And thank you for surviving being the only in your, in your medical school and making it through. (laughs) And yeah, well, you know, thank you. Continuing to be an inspiration and let us know when you're, when you're, when your book is done. I I, I really want to celebrate and support, you know, what you're doing in the workplace because it's a, it's a harrowing place. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I've also got a TEDx coming out uh, in the next few weeks, which I'll share with you. Oh, uh, good. I'll on, link it in uh, the show global notes. Global then. health issues. Global Thank health you. issues. I, I really appreciate that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Is it, did you already give it or? or? Yeah, yeah I, gave it, I gave it back in July in uh, Heidelberg, actually. No I was, kidding. I was in Germany myself. Yeah. I was okay. There. That's, that's yeah, kind of coincidental. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, it's serendipity. All right, then. Well, you have a good rest of your evening. And thank you for, for, your, for your generous time with us. You really inspired Thank you. Me. I really appreciate it. I've, I've, I've loved talking to you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thank you for being here and listening to this episode of the Sidewalk Talk podcast. If you like what you heard, tell your friends, tell your family, like and comment on the podcast publisher that you're listening from and subscribe. This will help us get the word out about changing our culture to one of connections.